again, and welcome to Vance Talk. I'm Tammy Garthwaite. <gasps> I know. What's I can't get used to that. It's just habit to say Tammy Simmons. I'm still going to probably say Tammy Simmons half the time. I, we, were, we were arguing, not arguing, we were discussing the other night at dinner when I signed the check. I'm like, can I just use my signature? Because my signature is basically a squiggly <laughs> line anyways. But I'm like, does it look close enough? I don't feel like, like, <laughs> it's a lot, Garthwaite. Well, I, and I don't, yeah. I'm Carly Garrick. This weekend, again, I had the whole thing of, oh, that's not how I would pronounce your name. And I'm like, okay, me either. I don't know. So people, uh, I don't know why people struggle with Garrick. It's not, people want to make it Garricky. I think it's that. And I don't that. know why, because I'm like, it's not like it's I-E. I, I think it's. Garricky. They come up Garricky. with all things, and I'm like, Garrick? It's, well, I mean, I, I just, I mean, there's a great show, if anyone's ever curious. The first show I ever did for the Carla Garrick show was just explaining how hard it was to actually, like, have to pick a new name. Yeah. Same it's thing you're big, experiencing well, now. Well, it shouldn't, it, to be honest, I was talking with, um, actually, I was talking with Kevin Smith, who's running for U.S. Senate the other day, about how convoluted government forms are. Like, it's all just so dumb. So when you go to get married, you have to go get a marriage license. And you fill out this form. And first of all, it's just the license. It's not the actual form. It's not the marriage certificate. And I get it. But So you pay for that. Some of the questions. How much is it? I don't remember if it was 35 or 50. Something, okay. You know, at $40. I don't really remember. And I'm sure in there somewhere it asked me if I wanted a marriage certificate. And I, uh, extra, I assume that meant extra copy. Like, no, I don't need multiple <laughs> copies. I'm not going to, like, frame them or anything. Right? So, oh, they just meant, like, a Well, copy. so what I thought was interesting, some of the questions were just to me. I'm like, I don't. I don't understand what this has to do with anything. They they ask you, you know, your name. They barely, it's not like they barely ask you your maiden name, but like the things that I think would be important seem to be like secondary, but they ask you your parents' names, which, okay, fine. So they can make sure. And you fill out the form like a normal human being and you put your, you know, John C. Smith or whatever. They make you spell out your parents' middle names. They make a point of it. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, there was a question on there about how many years of education you completed. Neither of those points should have anything, anything to do with getting permission from the government to be married. It was like, okay, I don't know why you need this. So you have to decide what your name is going to be. After. Guys don't, well, I guess guys could fill out. There probably was a section. But I was like, okay. And I think it's so, kind of de jure, isn't it? Like men are taking women's well, yeah, last that, names. You Didn't it, Amanda you Bolden's basic, husband yeah, you take can her make, last um, name? You can make your name whatever you want, right? At that point. So then after you're married. Oh, you can do. Like, I could, yeah. could I change my name to like Joe something, Blow. anything like yeah, not. On, I think on the marriage license. It's, so it's kind of yeah. weird, right? So, but then after you get married, I'm like, where's the marriage certificate? Because you can't change anything else about the marriage. Apparently they don't automatically send you one unless you pay $15, which uh -oh. I'm like, <laughs> fine. Can we just make that part of the original fee? Like, because. Who gets married and doesn't need the certificate? What's the point? Right. That's and it. That, like you're that, literally that doing point. it for the so, paperwork. Uh, so you're right? buying yeah. that certificate. So yeah. I laughed at that. So then when I went down, I got to talking with the city clerk's office about when I run for office. And I said, well, I'll still run as Tammy Simmons because that's my name. You know, that's who everybody knows me as. And uh, the deputy clerk came out and she's like, got the law. And she's like, just make sure, you know. So I'm going to have to put Tammy Simmons Garthwaite on the ballot with Simmons kind of being my nickname. It's just funny. And I said, what? I go, maybe I should have just left Simmons as my middle name. name. And she goes, you could still do it, but it'll cost you $130 and oh, you have God. to go before a judge. And I thought, so wait, on my marriage license, I could just fill it out and pick whatever I want. Right. But now it would cost $130 and I have to go before a judge. It's kind of silly. It the is. But it, you know what, honestly, <laughs> The government is silly in well, a lot of ways. it's just stuff that you go... You oh, heard it here first, well, folks. I mean, like, <laughs> why is it so complicated? I mean, it is because I it's mean, I idiotic. Guess they have, it's just they have to add and add and add things. There's probably some rationale for some, the education no. level because maybe like no. 200 years ago, you had no. to have a grade right. three but education why, in order to get in married. Or, you have you know, to graduate high school to get married. You know, like, so... Can we just redo the forms? But this is the way it always is. Half the times when you fill out things, when you fill out the form to run for office, you can't tell me we're all not like going, what? What do you want me to put on this link? And you never, you're never quite sure. Like, what do you, what do I need to put here? And it's like because it's this one size fits all form that somebody designed, you know, 20 years ago before there was 
Adobe and uh, it was just crazy. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I dealt with last week that like, okay, p- names, apparently your name is something and I don't know. I'm Tammy Simmons when it catches my, I don't know. So. Garth Waite. So if you Garth Waite, meaning field of Garth. No, field of Gar. Oh, is that what Because if Dan's family had come through Ellis Island, it would have been Garfield. Really? Yeah. So it's, which Dan tried to convince us we should both change our name to Garfield. And I'm like, I'm not doing a whole completely different name. Oh, you guys should have done that. Oh, the Garth Garfield Wait. jokes would have written themselves. It's just like, they're like, <laughs> it's so weird where names come from between, it, it is a lot of people. I know my family, my grandmother's name was Holt, H-O-L-T, in my world. What's the last four numbers of your social security? <laughs> my, my mother's maiden name. No, but I'm just, well, my mother's maiden name actually isn't her family name either. Now that you say that, that was a Lithuanian name that was butchered and shortened for I have no idea why. The tombstones all have the real name, but I don't know why all the legal stuff is a different name. And then, but my grandmother's in Germany was Hout. Mm. But when they came through Ellis Island, they wrote Holt. Yep. So they yep. like names just got changed I mean, so, willy so, nilly. So I mean, genuinely, that's kind of what happened to me, right? Like my uh, in, in Afrikaans, which is my home language. Uh, you say Hirika. Right. And, but that's not a thing. And But but the INS guy, w- w- so when we arrived, I had this yeah. massive envelope of, of documents, and then papers. they put you in an interrogation room, and you're just all sitting around, and then they come out and they call you. And the guy actually came out, and we were all looking around, like, who's he calling? Why right. is no one reacting? And eventually I was like, like oh, I think that's oh am I Garrick? Because Garrick and Hirika, you know, and, and, and I was... Is it spelled... Well, is it... I don't know anything about South Africa. Is it spelled that way in... Oh, it's spelled the same. It's Isn't just that, that we have a hard G, like you would yeah. say hummus or, right. you know, so... It's just interesting. Yeah, so, so anyway, names are weird. You got what you got. Well, and somebody... And then they tried to tell me, and I'm like, you yeah, know, so I was trying to understand why anybody would need multiple copies of their marriage certificate, because I'm just trying... I always think Well, because things. then you have one that you lose, and you have one right, in the but you States, can always go to right? City Hall and get one for 15 bucks, apparently. So... Well, you I can, didn't. unless you're an immigrant, like exactly. me, and getting paperwork no, and stuff. Like, I having agree. to get the jab, that oh, MMR, no. that totally I devastated totally my health. I totally agree if I didn't live Was here. because I couldn't prove that I had the Vax yeah. card. And I, um... I said, well, what would I need more than, like, I was, like, trying to think it through, like, what would I need more than one? Losing one I could get. So and she goes, I go, because I'm going to go change my driver's license. And I go, she goes, well, you'll need it for your driver's license. I was, they're not keeping my marriage certificate. Like, they don't keep your birth certificate. And she goes, no, but Social Security. I go, again, not keeping my documents. And she goes, oh, I think they're going to require that you leave it with them while they're changing your name. And I'm like, no. sorry, no, then I won't change my name at Social Security. And she's like, well, you have to within six months. I go, make me. Like, <laughs> I thought it was about a number. I thought that was my number. What difference does it make? So it'll be interesting. I'll I'll fill you all in about the absurdities of government as I go through this process. Battle, tuttle, battle, tuttle. That's from <laughs> Brazil. Great movie. Recommend. Um, so I noticed this morning. I don't remember why I noticed it. So, um... I've been to Cedar Swamp. Have you been to Cedar Swamp? I believe Up in so. Ward 12 in the corner. There's a nice trail road to dendrons and all that stuff. I haven't been yet this year. Um, they had been working oh, I on... I have been there in a long time. Right. I'm putting that on the list Yeah, I was say, the doing puppy. the same thing. Yeah. I'm like, oh, this should be a walk. Um, especially since I've never actually seen the rhododendrons in bloom. So we're too early for that. But if we go in the beginning of June, I think we see all them. But anyways, um, Cedar Swamp, which is up in the corner of Ward 12... Um, why well, have an address? Of course not. You can Google it. Um, they took their trail and they made it what's cons- called an all persons trail. So it is six feet wide. It narrows to five feet at one point. It's compacted crushed stone, um, 1. 5, 1.2 miles round trip. And basically it's so that people with disabilities, people who are in wheelchairs, people who have a, you know, are walking, somebody with a baby carriage, anything like that can do this loop in this park that's put on, maintained by the Nature Conservancy. So I thought that was kind of cool. I will definitely, um, I, we should definitely go back. We should take the dogs and I don't think dogs are allowed, but we should take the dogs anyways. (laughs) Um, because I'm What is that about? I don't know. As long as I'm picking up after my dog, you let people bring their children. Why can't I bring my dog? People, people litter in these trails. 
Oh my goodness. With plastic items. So I was but out. But we still let them go. I was out on the West Side Trails yesterday with Obi and um, did you also, did you notice the homeless guy who's oh, just geez. sleeping in the tree out here on the way into no, the building? Tr- no. There's, there's a potted, potted tree thing. with, and he's literally well, like just passed out well, right there. That was We don't of, have in town Manchester coming and cleaning the sidewalks every uh, like they were because you know we got rid of it down manchester so so but but out on the west side trails the tents are out there have been uh we we put in several tickets with the city because mm. there was just junk everywhere mm. it was a mess and we do pick up as we go but there's like you can't you know tr- a couch tires <laughs> right. and half a car right. and you know like crap and uh and so we put in some tickets, so the city did clear one area, but then I was looking because this is right at that moment where there's no... There's no, br- no leaves. Brush. Yeah. yeah, so you can actually, it, it really does change how mm. you can look at the landscape of stuff. And uh, yeah. Well, that, that, I noticed, uh, last, I think it was last weekend, so um, the, the homeless camp area near the Cracker Barrel billboard the, that owner i've mentioned it before he had to have it cleaned they cut down all the shrubbery mm. around it um i think the city you know like they moved when we drove by there was pot you know stuff moved down towards the road i'm assuming that the, i'm hoping that the city came by and took that somebody came by and took it um but then as dan, dan and i were going to home depot and if you're going from what whatever that is i don't know if that's march street where you turn at walmart and you come in the backside. All of a sudden, we're both like, holy cow. Yeah, that whole, that homeless encampment is now in the woods outside of Home Depot instead of behind Walmart. And what we're noticing, and Victoria said she noticed this specifically, what's happening is property owners are clear cutting lots so that the homeless won't stay in them, which uh, pushes the homeless to another lot. But what, even worse, it's also cl- clear cutting all the all the trees and everything in our property. So on one hand, we when somebody's building a store or something, they have to include greenery, right? We require them to plant trees. But then on the other hand, we're not doing anything to prevent these homeless camps. So property owners are literally clear cutting. So yeah, how I mean, is it? I, I did notice when we went up to the Upper Valley last week, uh, we actually went up to see James O'Keefe, mm. and I'll tell you guys about that in a second. But um, I did notice, I mean, timber prices are really high. Mm, so very. there's a lot of clear cutting just going on. There's like a band of trees between the highway and the thing. But yeah. because it's that time where you can see things, yeah. I was like, oh, wow, I could see at least four or five big lots where they uh we're taking out um, yeah, so trees, which, you know, it's fine. It's just, it I mean, makes it's sense. fine if that's for timber. I, I, what I found, I had somebody else asking me yesterday why it is, because why the city accumulates property and why they let stuff get so bad on it, which is a good point. And then I started looking at some maps. So the example was, um, uh, I can't even think, Woodbury Street, which is where Carisbrook is. So imagine Comfort Inn up to South Main, right? So there's maybe two houses on that street in Carisbrook. And then, but if you look on the tax map, a lot of the property is owned by the state of New Hampshire. And it looks like the corner might be owned by the city. And it makes me wonder like, wait, wait, why does the state of New Hampshire own these various little, and they're all just like mm-hmm. little parcels. But then I started thinking about it. I'm like, well, it's probably when the highway went in, you know, right? and they, they, did, t- they bought yeah. property to expand the road Mm. and then they didn't use that. So now there's these weird little pockets of land owned by the state because nobody can do anything because it's just a little tiny piece. It's just interesting that you're like, oh, I wonder how that, how does that come to be? But then you do look, I mean, for the state, it's one thing, but for the city, it's truly unfortunate when there's property that is owned by the city that they don't clear, keep clean. Um, or maintain, or mow, or anything. So, you know, like, I like people to be responsible property owners. I was thinking it as I was driving it here. Whether you're a homeowner or a business owner, take some freaking pride in your property. There are too many businesses that let their property just, I mean, yeah, you might have painted it 20 years ago, but it looks like hell now. My house and, needs to be painted. Yeah, I readily is, admit it. Is it an eyesore? <laughs> like, I'm talking, you know... 
garage uh, mechanics that have just like right. debris everywhere and the buildings are just nasty like buy a couple gallon five gallon buckets of paint and paint it so i actually yeah and the graffiti and yeah. i would love to see us actually on the west side put up some nice welcome to the west yeah. side welcome we heart west yeah. kind of stuff because um you know, sometimes there is like one wall coming up the yeah. hill from the school where it's all graffiti and, and we can no, make right, it prettier. Right. But I do want to make one point about personal responsibility. You know, I think we lose sight of this. I think people hear that and they feel like someone's talking at them, nope. that it's kind of this authoritarian sort of thing, like someone's finger or, yeah, wagging like you and being like, you more. should, yeah. whatever. Um, I'm re-listening. I read this when I was probably in college or maybe high school, this Six Pillars of Self-Esteem, mm -hmm. right? So it's a, it's a book, I think, from the 60s. I don't know. I have it on Audible. It's in mm -hmm. the kitchen. So they're talking about self-esteem, and it really struck me this morning uh, where he talked about personal responsibility, but in the relationship to self-esteem, meaning that your, your personal responsibility is actually something that makes you feel better about right. yourself. It does. So by way of example, the dude in the plant downstairs, <laughs> The dude's right? sitting in the tree. Downstairs. <laughs> Um, you know, like I was thinking in the elevator up, I was like, what life choices has led him to this situation? Because he's probably not happy. Addiction, I'm assuming, and or, you know, some kind of mel mental health thing and probably a combination of those things. Fine. But it's like you have to start to make choices right. that are responsible which might sound like finger wagging, but if you flip it to say there's not someone telling you do this, it's something, a spark inside you that Saying, says, hey. hey, if I do this, I'm gonna feel better about myself. Mm -hmm. And when I feel better about myself, I start to make better choices. And so, you know, I think it's really important. Well, I, mean, I, I feel like we have to reteach people how to be human well, and, and about, normal. Think about that scenario and um, the sober homes. And so you know, you've got like the one up on Orange Street that Rich Gerard's always bitching about. Um, there are women living in a home that is the probably the best looking home on the street. They are d making choices to better their lives and put themselves in a better situation. They're doing all the right things, but yet you still have people complaining about their house. So like, rather than boosting them to say, you know what, good for you for making right. the right choices, we're here for you. Too many people, and it's not just that one house, they do it all the time. They're like, oh, we can't have that. And it's like, but think about think about what you're diminishing. You're diminishing people trying to improve their life so that they aren't a burden on the community, so that they're in a better place, so that they in turn can help lift somebody else up. But th both that, but again, I think like we should not come at this as don't be a burden or you have some duty to something else or someone else or to mm. society. I actually want to flip it where I'm like, no, forget about all of that. All you have is a duty to yourself to not be a problem. <laughs> so it becomes this thing of uh, if we want society to function, mm. then again, it's not this this uh common what do we, they say the common good or you know for the greater for, good. For, for the greater the good greater or for good. everyone so that's just a big group of people right so when you parse it down 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 it's a group of individuals and so how does society be healthy each individual has to do their part and not suck right so <laughs> if you're True. sucking at something in life take a good hard right. look in the mirror and make some changes. And I'm proof positive that yep. it can be done. And so, you know, folks, it starts with each of us. So if yep. you're pointing your finger at anyone else, I want you to go home, take a good long look in the mirror and decide what you need to do to be a functioning part of the greater good. Yep. And you do that by being good to yourself. So tell us a little bit about James O'Keefe. Yeah, so for folks who don't know, James O'Keefe is the founder and muckwrecker of Project Veritas. Yep. Project Veritas, I believe, started about 10 years mm. ago, maybe even longer. I do remember when I was still drinking back in the day, I had some martinis with uh, James over there at the copper door and before they boycotted 
free staters. Uh, anyway, so um, so he's a you know he he he's a controversial figure. Mm -hmm. Love him or hate him. Uh, where he sort of became famous is he did the acorn yes. thing back in the day. So they they tend to do sort of guerrilla style or undercover or investigative reporting. Uh, costumes, the whole thing. The thing that made people mad about the acorn thing, so this was basically a dude who dressed up as what you would call a proverbial pimp. Like, there was no doubt. I mean, like, big right. coat, hat, a uh, cane. I mean, it was ridiculous. It was like, okay, how could you not see this as satire? <laughs> but apparently no one did. Um, so, so that's sort of where he cut his teeth. His new book is Muckracker, yeah. and Am I saying that right? I think I, I think am. so. Muckraker, Muck, maybe? Muckraker sound. I don't know. Raker, maybe with M -U -C -K -R -A -K -E -R. a K. M-U-C-K-R-A-K-E-R. Um, you say it however you want. Uh, but basically, it's his new book, and he talks about all these lawsuits. So he came, yeah. and, and I really like the way he framed it. So basically, I guess he did a class with Dartmouth. Yeah maybe with the journalism students, and then he did this open to the public talk. He was expecting, and I, actually, honestly, I was expecting, like, you know, maybe some pushback, right. maybe some people who are protesting. It was all awfully civilized, which tells me maybe we're moving beyond the sort of hysteria, the get the mob days. out for dumb ideas thing, and we're, we're ready to go, oh, maybe we need to debate these ideas. Yeah. Uh, so he um, he did his talk on the the article that was published in the Dartmouth newspaper okay. by the former editor of the Dartmouth newspaper, and uh, this guy basically wrote an opinion piece, but where he was presenting facts that weren't facts; they were actually opinions. Mm -hmm. So he sort of dissected this article as a way to say, hey, let's look at this. What is the role of the press yep. and the media? Is its job just to offer opinions, which is kind of where we are now? And that's fine. Everyone's entitled to an opinion. But then you have to tell me, this is your opinion. My opinion is James O'Keefe is an award-winning uh, writer or a liar, whatever your opinion is. But if you're going to call him a liar and you can't prove it, then that is not a newspaper article, Correct. right? So he kind of broke that down, which I thought was cool yeah. and interesting. Um, there were maybe a hundred people. Hmm. Uh, it, you know, he's he's a great speaker, a dynamic speaker, yeah. and I honestly think he's like one of the last crusaders who's actually trying to seek the truth. One of the cool things he addressed is. You know, people will say, well, it's not fair that you do this sort of um, undercover reporting, right? So a lot of the things that were banned over the last two years off social media were, amongst other things, people from CNN admitting that they lied about Trump, yep. admitting that they, you know, pushed up the COVID fear factor in order to break your brains. Uh, you know, like, the, there's all this stuff. And so people are like, that's not fair. You can't do that. That's not reporting. You're making us look bad. And it's like, uh, so he had a quote, I forget from whom it was, but uh, where he talked about, actually, the role of investigative reporting is exactly right, to that. Uncover the because here's the thing. When people are doing shady crap, they don't tell you. Right. You have to actually right. catch them. Right. So, so you have to go undercover and you have to dig in. I mean, that's just... And, and does anybody really believe that that's not how investigative reporting works? I mean, I don't even know works? what people believe anymore. But here is a thought, though. It did actually remind me at that time, I was like, wow, you know how far we've actually strayed off the course of things? Because given the technology that we have available mm -hmm. to us now, the ubiquitous, I mean, we all have a camera that can record on us most of the time, right? The fact that we're not seeing way, way, way more recordings, whistleblowing mm -hmm. stuff coming out actually tells you how unhealthy our, our media landscape is. It tells you how bad the legacy news is and that they are not actually giving you objective, factual, reported facts. They are expressing opinions. Now, there was a great clip this morning that I showed uh, showed uh, Tammy right when we sat down. That's just this guy, I think it was MSNBC, yeah, right? It was and he's MSNBC. just lamenting. He's just like, 
oh my goodness, with, with, with Elon buying Twitter, Twitter can now like suppress the truth and not show people and blah. And I mean, Which is it has exactly tens- the opposite of why Elon is spending what, 44 billion, billion dollars, dollars to buy Twitter, not to curtail speech and limit it to only one perspective, but to open Twitter back up so that there is some, some place where free speech is allowed on social media. And here's the thing, it'll be interesting. $44 billion, dollars. I mean, good on him. Well, you know, and of course the Twitter sphere, uh, yes, good on him. Uh, honestly, uh, I think this is going to be a very, very, very positive development. Mm-hmm. Uh, hopefully, you know, I did see a bunch of people who are like, ah, I'm gonna leave Twitter now. I'm like, okay, okay. so they're go destroy TikTok. They're going to Canada. <laughs> If Canada buys Elon Musk, I'm moving to Twitter. <laughs> um, speaking of journalism and investigative reporting and factual stuff, um, unfortunately, in the last few days, um, longtime New Hampshire reporter John DeStaso passed away. He was only 68 years old. He was literally a staple in New Hampshire mm-hmm. political reporting, among other things. But we're... Um, I mean, I can remember him back from as far as I can go back, and he was always really sincere. I always felt he was sincere, he was honest. When you talked to him off the record, he kept it off the record. Mm -hmm. Um, He got the story right most of the time, you know, factual. Didn't pander to one political party or the other. He's a reporter. He actually did did reporting. Um, So that's a big loss for New Hampshire and for reporting in general, because like you said, there's not that many that are doing that type of thing. Um, interesting talk about technology. I did read this morning that DVDs are 25 years old. There you go. Boomers. I'm still 29, I, but guys. Isn't that interesting? 25, only 25 years we've had DVDs. Hmm. Um, I did want to mention a couple things before we run out of time, because we will. Um, we Heart West has a whole schedule out for their cleanups for the year. Uh, May 2nd at 6 p.m., they, so that would be Monday night, next Monday night, May 2nd, 6 p.m. They're cleaning up the area of Kelly Street in Coolidge. Um, so you can go out there and help if you're, especially if you live in that neighborhood and you want to see that corner cleaned up a bit. And I also wanted to mention the Parkside Community Garden Group. Um, they are the ones who have the community gardens over near Parkside, mm-hmm. um, which is near Gosler, right? Is yep. that what it's called? Um, 429, which is this Friday at 10 in the morning. They have an open house and they're doing the bed cleanup because I believe on May 5th, May 13th, they're installing a shade shelter or whatever. Um, they did, as last I knew, still have beds available for people. It's $15 for the entire year. I think um, I'm gonna get a bed. It's right near your house. It'd be kind of cool. You could just right? walk down with the dog, check on the yep. vegetables, come back. Yep. Um, but anyways, you can find them on, um, both of them you can find on Facebook. We Heart West, I believe, has a Facebook page. Yep. And if not, you can look in Manchester, uh, West Manchester chat if you live on the west side. Or uh, Parkside Community Garden Group. I know that's how I found them on Facebook. Two great events over there on our side of the river um, where you can get out and get involved in your neighborhood and help make Manchester a better place. Um, other than that, if you have anything, email us at manchtalk at gmail.com. And maybe between now and next week, we'll have checked out Cedar Swamp. Take care, guys. Bye.